Boa tarde a todas e a todos. É com grande prazer que iniciamos esse novo módulo da Escola de Estudos Avançados de Água e Sociedade sob Mudanças. É, good afternoon. We are just starting a new model of the School of Advanced Studies on Water and Society under Change, being granted by the CAPES, Brazilian CAPES, and also with the participation of Professor Raghavan Srinivasan from Texas AM University, the United States of America, and Professor Daniele de Almeida Bresciani, Federal University of Pelotas. I am Eduardo Mario Mendiondo, chair of this school, and here we have the CEO of this school, Gabriela Chiquito Gesuado, who I, I would like to thank also your management. So uh, this is a very short uh, uh, introduction. I will uh, pass my word to Gabriela, and after that, here to, to Daniele, and finally, but not least, uh, uh, to Professor Raghavan Srinivasan. I am very, very proud for this uh, CAPIS contribution and also for the participation of Professor uh, Srinivasan and Professor Bresciani with us during this uh, uh, week. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Hi, I'm Gabriela. I'm the one who is sending emails for you. And I'm going to stay with you this week, sending information, emails, any doubts, you can contact me. And I hope you enjoy the course. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dani, Daniele Bresciani. Um, I am a professor at University, uh, Federal University of Pelotas. And I'm really glad to be here today and this week with you. And uh, here, I graduated here, so for me, it's really special to be back and uh, with t both of my advisors as well. So I'm really glad. Well, thank you. That's all. So, Srini. Uh, good afternoon again. I'm just coming directly fresh from the airport, so I, ho I hope I, uh, I won't go to sleep, actually, while I'm talking to you. Um, it's very informal, so please ask questions. I'm very happy to be here. This must be like the nth time he's hosting me right now, Dr. Mario and uh, Professor Mario and Daniele and the, the whole group, actually, Dennis and the group here. So this is like a second home for me, actually. So just like she's homecoming here back to the university, I'm, this is a second home for me, and I've been uh, here more frequent visitor than anybody else. And I'm really happy, and I'm really uh, glad I could come this week and uh, be part of this program. And anything I can contribute to your science or your knowledge, please feel free to ask questions, actually. That's the best way to, for uh, all, uh, all of us to learn, actually. OK? Thank you. Um, I would like also to ask, uh, in time, only to, to mention that uh, also that this is part of some logos here. Uh, sorry, that's. In the, in the next uh, day, we are putting the logos of Texas AM. Sorry, that this was an our fault. And also the Federal University of Pelotas here is over there. Eh? But here we have some groups are very important supporting these uh, uh, ideas, these brainstorming. Some of them are international, some are Brazilian, national. So one of them is the Pantaray Decade for the International Association of Hydrological Science. Uh, that is a, a, a Water and society under change is the same logo of our uh, School of Advanced Studies. So this is this logo here. Also, we have an um, interdisciplinary research group on education and research in disasters. So this is this logo, the CIPET. Uh, also, we have this logo is the interdisciplinary center of applied mathematics to industry for industry, that is this logo here. We have also the Interdisciplinary Center of Climate Investigation, that is the INCLINE, is an interdisciplinary group also. Um, the National Institute of Science and Technology on Climate Change, also an interdisciplinary group uh, um, working in Brazil and in overseas countries. And of course, here the logos of uh, our, our graduate program, our school of engineering, and of course, the logo of FAPESPI, CAPES, and CNPQ, because uh, they are partially or fully granted this 
this moment. So thank you, thank you very much for coming, Srini and Daniele. And we'd like to ask you uh, together applause to them and uh, <clears throat> making the, 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 the best greetings for a fruitful week to everyone. Thank you very much. So again, good afternoon. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, how many of you using or heard about SWAT? Okay, one, two, okay, quite a few. So what I'm going to do is, first few slides, I'm going to talk about the SWAT as it exists today. Then I'm going to talk about our next generation of SWAT that we are developing called SWAT Plus. Okay, so most of the time I'll be spending is on the SWAT Plus. Why are we doing this and what are the ma major changes or major development in SWAT Plus that might of uh, become useful to your research project and so on. Okay. So for those of you who may not be familiar with SWAT, SWAT has been in existence for more than 30 years. And um, it's a product of making more than 45 years. Of course, I'm, I'm pretty much about 25 years I've been with this group actually. So, but it is much before my time. They started working with a model. It is one of the, um, I mean, SWOT applications or SWOT model usage is all around the world one of the largest number of model use in the world um, in terms of looking at land use change, environmental, climate, uh, pollution, atmospheric pollution, anything you want to name actually, the SWOT is able to do that. And it, it can work both at daily and sub-daily time step. Um, on sub-daily term step, it's mainly on hydrology and sediment. Okay, the remaining water quality is still daily term step, like nitrogen, phosphorus, pesticides, and so on. It is very comprehensive, those who have used it, and worldwide, it's been used around the world in many, many, many parts of the world, and we have currently more than 4,000 peer-reviewed publications published. So this is one of the largest body of knowledge that we have today in any hydrological model. If you want to compare this model with another model, the next model may have about 150. Okay, so that's a difference between SWOT usage around the world compared to the other models. SWOT is comprehensive in hydrology, so the only input that you are going to provide here is your precipitation, what is the land use, and what is the soil. So the rest are all model predicts. It predicts how much is evapotranspiration daily, how much is runoff, how much is lateral flow, how much is um, uh, return flow back to the river, and how much recharge to the deep aquifer. So this is computed on a daily basis or sub-daily basis for throughout the simulation period, whether that's uh, one day, one year, hundreds of years, depending on the data that you have both for the past and also you can look at it in the future, okay? And again, this is the erosion equation. I'm not going to go through that actually, just to give you an idea. It's also computed on a daily basis. We compute both erosion and sediment deposition, okay? So it computes what's happening in the landscape, how much of that erosion reaches the river, and once it's in the river, how does that transport within the river, actually? So we have various equations that you can choose to track the sediment deposition and scouring and uh, erosion along the channels. SWAT can also handle comprehensive nitrogen cycle. Okay? So here we divide the nitrogen into three forms, atmospheric, air, soil, and water, okay? And we have both organic and inorganic form, actually. So meaning soluble form and attached to sediment form. So it's a comprehensive picture of looking at the entire nitrogen balance as its input into the system. So you have all the inputs, all the outputs, and also what is, stays back in the soil in the various form. It also calculates all the conversion factors from residue to soil to plant and to runoff and leaching to the groundwater, everything is calculated in SWOT actually, as far as nitrogen is concerned. Same thing for phosphorus. 
Phosphorus is not as detailed as nitrogen actually, but because phosphorus by nature is not soluble, okay? It attached to sediment, so it does not dissolve quickly and move with water. It moves with sediment. So wherever you have a lot of sediment, you are, you are going to have a lot of phosphorus also, okay? So in addition to that, we also route the water, the sediment, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, pesticide, bacteria along the river from top of the watershed to all the way to the outlet of the watershed. So we have a simple steady state model that tracks your movement of pollution along the river actually. Okay? You can also have wetlands and water bodies as well as ponds in the modeling system. So this is just to give you how does the in-stream, meaning in the river, how does the nutrient transform actually. We keep track of four forms of nitrogen. So these are the four forms of nitrogen. Organic nitrogen, soluble nitrogen, nitrate, nitrite. Two forms of phosphorus, dissolved and organic phosphorus. Two forms of carb I mean, um, oxygen actually. One is the dissolved oxygen, another is the carbonaceous oxygen demand. Then algae, two, two forms of algae. Okay? All these things are tracked both in the river, but also in the sediment, sediment column in the river, actually. Okay? So as I already mentioned, you can also simulate the dams, lakes, ponds, and wetlands, where the model will estimate the inflow going into the lake and how much is evaporation from the lake, seepage losses, release of water from the dam or ponds, and then track downstream. So you can model the entire watershed ecosystem without any problem with SWOT, actually. So this is where we are today, okay? So now I want to transition. There's one more slide before I transition to the SWOT plus, okay? So we do have several different options. So even with one data set, you can build almost 15 different models. You can use a combination of different evapotranspiration equation, different runoff equations, or different channel uh, routing equation, or water quality equation. So by using the different combination of these equations, you will be able to si simulate 15 different sub-models within the same data set. You don't have to do anything. Just change the equation and run the model and look at which one is more realistic to your observation data set, actually, okay? So it's part of trying to look at the structural uncertainty of your model, okay? Did I use the right equation? Did the equation represent my watershed properly? So those are the kind of things that you could answer through this set of um, equations, okay? So just to conclude, the major strength of the SWOT model is upland process, the landscape process. Okay, it has got a very detailed agricultural management. You can simulate tillage, you can simulate fertilizer application, you can simulate the uh, manure application, and so on and so forth, actually. Then it's using physically-based inputs. The only hydrological model that we know today that also has crop growth is SWOT, actually. So in other words, it not only simulates the chemical, the hydrology, the biology, and so on, it also simulates the growth, of, growth cycle of your plant. Okay, whether it is a tree crops, whether it is a tree, whether it is a grass, whether it is a crop like sugarcane, soybean, cotton, corn, whatever it is, the model will be able to simulate that actually. And model will be able to keep track of all the nutrients that the plant is taking, how much water the plant is taking, how deep the root system grows. The entire growth cycle of plant is also simulated. That's one of the reasons SWOT is called crop-centric or vegetation-centric model. Everything revolves, everything goes around the plant. Okay? So that's our major main, you want to call this kernel or main uh, center of our model, actually. If there is something wrong with our plant model, everything else is going to be wrong also. Okay? So that's why this model is very, very unique compared to any other model out there actually right now. So we already talked about nutrient cycling, land management. We also have several different urban 
the, um, processes that we have added recently. We can simulate the urban ponds, urban structures, both surface and underground structures. And you can also simulate um, what I call soft BMP, like roof gardens. You can put a garden on the roof, how that's going to change your climate, for example. How much water you could save. How much runoff is going to be limited, actually. Or you can have a rain garden. Okay? So you can collect water from your roof and use it for your garden, for example. Or you can have things like pavement, porous pavement. I mean, being an engineer, you all know very well, actually, recently there is a pavement or a concrete that was produced that's also equally, per, it also you can percolate water through that concrete. Okay, it's equally, the same equal strength, but it can seep through. The water is just like a soil. Okay, it can seep through that, actually. So there are lots of new technology that's coming up, and the model is able to simulate a lot of them, actually. Okay. So now I'm transitioning to SWAT plus. Why SWAT plus? Okay. What is the major benefit of SWAT plus, for example? Okay. So it is still written in Fortran. We have not changed to any modern uh, language, computer language. We are still the guys who are writing the code. Is still they know only Fortran. So they, these are engineers from 70s and 80s. So they continue to work in that same arena, but it works. It functions, so why change it, okay? Um, the algorithm, per se, has not changed much. We are adding new algorithms. We are also making it very modular or very um, you know, simplified so that others can bring their own model or their own algorithm and add, for example, hydrology. We have given you two options. So you could come back and say, okay, I have another hydrology model that I want to use in this. You can easily write a subroutine and drop it right there, actually, and it should be able to compile and be able to make use of that, actually. So everything is mo modular now, actually. So it'll be easier to integrate other models or other components, not, not the entire model, even the components you can bring in and integrate with SWOT, actually. The code is completely restructured. And previously, we used to have a file called fig file that controls everything, actually. Now we are changing that to spatial objects. I'll talk about what is spatial objects in the next slides. Okay? And the whole data structure has completely changed, actually. We used to have hundreds and hundreds of files or thousands of files to set up a watershed, actually. But now you don't need that many anymore, actually. The it's number of files are fixed to 30, the total number of files. So it makes it a lot easier to read and write. Okay? Your amount of time it takes to execute your inputs is not the same what used to be before. And the most important thing is it helps us to work as a community, meaning I can develop a part of the model and able to share that model with another group that may be more sophisticated or more knowledgeable about a different processes, and they could take it and run with it, actually. Okay? So, like I said, in the current SWAT, if you have a 5 HRU, you have 5 soil file. If you have 5,000 HRUs, you have 5,000 soil file, actually. Okay, that's what it's dealt right now. But in the SWAT plus, 5 HRU is still one soil file. If you have 5,000 HRU, still one file. So we reduced the number of file structure tremendously now. So like I said, instead of thousands and thousands of files, now you are going to deal with 30 files maximum. Okay? So that's the biggest benefit here. Okay, this is just the structure. I don't need to go through this. Basically, we reduce the number of input files. All these things will be automatically taken care of by your GIS interface. We are also writing code to automatically upgrade from SWAT to SWAT plus files. Okay? But currently, our interface works with QGIS, which is a public domain GIS. And eventually, we will have ArcGIS also. But right now, it works with QGIS. OK, so this is what the current SWAT looks like. SWAT, which is you have a watershed. That watershed divides into sub-watersheds. And then that sub-watershed each divided into HRUs. OK, this is the current structure. 
but this is going to be the new structure in SWAT plus. You still have a watershed, you can have sub-basins. Within the sub-basin, you first divide all the water bodies separately. Okay? So water areas are separated like lake, ponds, wetlands, those will be separate. So the remaining landscape, sorry, the remaining area is divided into what we call landscapes. I will explain what is landscape in the next slide actually. Then each landscape can have HRUs. Okay, so group of HRUs become landscape, landscape becomes sub-basin, and the sub-basin becomes the watershed. Okay. <clears throat> so it helps us to simulate the water areas more uh, realistically. Until now, we were double accounting some other water areas in the modeling system. So this will help us to eliminate that, and we can also take advantage of the landscape position, especially on the routing component actually. Right now, we take all HRUs and then dump it to the watershed outlet actually, okay, our sub-basin outlet. So now you can route from field to field if you want to actually, okay. So if you look at here, here are the elements. This is your watershed. Within the watershed, you have a stream. So that stream could be, you can have as many number of streams. Previously, you, you can have one stream per sub-basin. Now you are no longer limited by one stream, actually. Within a sub-basin, you can have first order, second order, third order streams, actually, okay, depending on the size of your sub-basin. Okay? So if you're, if you're developing a model for Parana, then you can have all the tributaries of Parana to be a sub-basin. So within the tributary, you can have first order, second order, and third order. All could be in one, one sub-basin. So within that sub-basin, for example, let's say this is one sub-basin here, and you have a stream. Within that, you can have two landscape units. One is called floodplain, and another is called upland. Okay? So the upper portion of the watershed, and one along the creek, along the rivers. Okay? So that floodplains can be also on first order, second order, and third order streams. Okay? So it's up to you how you want to divide the landscape at this point, actually. <clears throat> so we have tested four different algorithms. There is a paper already written and to test which one of the landscape algorithm works better. Okay? Anything that you see here, this dark color, those are the floodplain. The lighter color is a landscape, meaning the agricultural land or forest land or range land or whatever. Okay? So we tested several different algorithms. Some did not produce as much, like for example, topographic index, for example, wetness index. Okay? The slope position produced somewhat decent, the uniform flood stage and the variable flood stage, actually. So we tested all of them, and then we finally settled on the slope position, actually. That seems to produce more realistic, because we compared that map with our flood maps. Okay? So that produced better, but there is not one method that's going to fit for every project, actually. So, so this is what's available right now. Within that, we have two options in the QSWAT. Q tomorrow and day after when we go through, I will talk about that more, actually. So like as I said previously, we have now converted all the connections by spatial objects. Okay. So you could have HRU, such as urban HRU, pasture HRU, water HRU, um, sorry, wheat HRU, corn, sorghum, cotton, sugarcane, whatever it may be actually. Then those could be connected to directly to a channel. So if that field is next to a channel, they can go directly to a channel. Or if that field is next to a floodplain, it can go to a floodplain. Or if that field is next to another field, it can go to another field. So it will be more realistic way of distributing your runoff, sediment, nitrogen, phosphorus, and so on, both surface and subsurface. Okay? So the, it can reach any one of these for objects, actually, spatial objects. So you can take... Say, even you can portion that, actually. You can say 75% is going to the channel, remaining 25% going to the reservoir, for example, below the ground. Okay? Or you could say 100% of them is going to aquifer, for example. If it is a recharge zone and there is a water, nothing is leaving the field, 
it's not going to the river, it's all percolating to the groundwater, you can run the water through ground also, actually. So you as a user have a full control on how the objects, the spatial objects, the spatial hydrological response unit connected to which form. Previously, always it has to go through a river. Okay? So now you are not restricted to only to the river. It could be a landscape, it could be a, another HRU, or it could be a reservoir, it could be aquifer, it can be anything. Okay? So, like I said, you could take the HRUs into two classes. One is upland HRUs, floodplain HRUs. Okay, so that's what you're seeing here. Upland HRUs, floodplain HRUs. Then you can take the upland HRU, directly send it to a floodplain, and then from floodplain or upland directly to the channel, or you can take floodplain to a channel pond and wetlands back to a channel. Okay, You can take your upland HRUs and then po portion of that goes to aquifer. And from aquifer to aquifer. So you can have multiple aquifers. You are not restricted to just one aquifer actually. Then you can have floodplain going to aquifer. Aquifer back to the channel which is the base flow. And channel to channel connectivity. So you can see it's a completely integrated system that you can pretty much model any complex environment with this. So you're not restricted. You don't have to assume, you don't have to simplify your watershed structure in order to simulate. That's what you have been doing until today with our current SWOT. So this is going to help you to change all those and be able to have more realistic uh, application or re more realistic way of integrating, actually. So you don't have to take reservoir back to the aquifer anymore, actually. It's going to go to the downstream. It, it doesn't go up, up, up the stream, actually. Again, I know it's too busy, just for bear with me, actually. So here again, you can have landscape. Okay, the landscape unit two. So this is the upland. This is the floodplain, and you may have four HRUs here. They all can recharge, and only part of them going to the reservoir. The remaining part goes to the HRU. I mean the uh, floodplain HRUs, and then the, from the floodplain it goes to channel. It can also recharge to the aquifer, and whatever coming from this aquifer can also go. The same structure what I show you in the previous screen is shown here. Here we are also showing you that you don't have to send all the water, all the sediment. You can send only fraction of what's reaching there, actually. Okay? So the, the connection files are all in green. So these are all the connection that connects the spatial objects. Okay? So the reservoirs is in blue. That's why the reservoir here. And then the channel connect is in the uh, dark blue here, actually. You can even have endless connectivity. So you could have water channel feeding to a reservoir, and the reservoir is feeding to recharge aquifer, and the aquifer going back to channel again. Okay. Previously, it was not possible in the current SWAT, actually. It has to be always one direction only, actually. Now you can have water moving in circle. For example, especially in the irrigation canals, right? The water may come from a, a, a river, passed on to canal, the canal goes to a field, and the, from the one field to another field, another field, then the water get recycled back to the, to the next field, actually, next downstream field, and so on and so forth. So you will be able to have endless connectivity in this way. And one of the projects that we are trying to work on this, taking this concept is a river in um, Jordan. Okay, you all know the Jordan River, right? It's just how significant is that river for a lot of uh, religious reason and other reason. Okay, so that river is completely modified today. It's no natural, nothing natural about that river anymore. Okay, 
So everything is diverted, everything is connected, everything is managed. Every little bit of water is managed highly. Okay? So that's what all this arrow that I'm showing you here, how many times is going left and right, actually. It's going in all directions, actually. So we are trying to set up this model in SWOT Plus, taking one of the complex environment to see how to do in SWOT Plus a system like this, actually. So this is something we are working on. OK. So, so far I talked about the landscape and the connectivity and so on. We also have simplified or enhanced significantly how to represent water bodies in SWOT. OK. So you could have, if you look at this one, you could have just one reservoir or one lake or one pond. This is how it was in current SWAT. Okay? But in reality, if you look at it, that same lake may span across multiple sub-watersheds. Okay? You cannot have, you have to pick one sub-basin right now in SWAT, okay? like a virtual lake. And then you may also have a lot of what we call player lakes. Player lakes are the local depression. So these are the areas where you have local depression. It is not draining to a river. Water comes and collects. It's a lake, it's a simple lake. So you could have hundreds of lakes like this, for example, here. Okay? It all have a small drainage. But they don't drain to a river, actually. They just drain to the local depressions. You can represent that easily now in SWAT. Okay? SWAT plus. And you may have a marshland where the water comes to the marshland and then it could bifurcate, right? So if you go near the ocean, so the river, the major river comes, it goes to a floodplain, and the water will go in 10 different directions, actually. So in current SWAT, you cannot simulate. It will be always one-to-one -one connection. So you're no longer restricted by that, actually. So you could have one-to-many connections now in SWAT plus. Okay? So one river could be divided into multiple rivers if you need to. Okay? So those are all some of the major benefits. And then finally, the unconnected drainage, meaning the water goes and suddenly disappears in the soil. Then it comes back again downstream somewhere else, actually. So there are lots of rivers, like Lost River, actually. The river that goes and nowhere and then suddenly reappears downstream because of the groundwater connections and things like that. So you can represent those things also in the model now. So this is what's happening now. I mean, this is what current SWAT is doing. You have one sub-basin. So okay, this is, let's say, a watershed with three sub-basins. You have three streams. That's how it's represented in SWAT right now. Whereas in the SWAT Plus, you could have one same three sub-basins, but the stream, there could be a main stream, there could be a second order, and first order streams, actually. You can have as many orders of streams as you want. And this is all upland. The green, light green is upland. This yellow is floodplain. Okay? And you can also have connectivity. So here is a first order, second order, third order. Okay? In the same sub-basin, you can have multiple orders without any problem there, actually. So that's what I'm represented here. So the green are the first order, the blue is the second order, and the red is the third order streams. Okay? So you can have multiple orders in the same sub-basin. Unlike previously, you have only one. So when I route it, I'm routing only here. I'm not routing all the small, small segments in the model, actually. I'm assuming they are all conservative, meaning they are not transforming anything, actually. By doing this way, with taking into account of every field, every edge of the field connected to a river, you are able to simulate almost every stream miles in the watershed. So if I look at it here, for example, the annual erosion, where does the erosion comes from, actually? If you look at it, most of them are coming from your first order streams. Okay, this is a mile, uh, sorry, this is a tons per year. Uh, I think it's, this is the length of the uh, stream. For example, first order stream is 18,800 kilometer long. And it produces this much erosion here, actually. Okay? So we were not even looking at any of these 
before actually. The first order and second order, we were not looking at it. We are looking at only the third order streams when we are simulating the current SWOT actually. By having the first order and second order, you'll really able to represent. So if you look at these two, that's of the total 3,600, it's almost 2,700 actually, almost 70 to 80 percent of the streams we are not simulating it. Okay, the small creeks we are not simulating in SWAT. Okay, so that's the major benefit of going into the SWAT plus is to be able to have all those connectivity, including the small streams in the watershed. So again, I'm trying to show you one more picture of the same thing. If you look at a landscape like what you see here, so this is the field, like a farmer's land. That could be a sugarcane, soybean, eucalyptus, whatever they are growing there actually. And it's going to generate some sheet and drill erosion. We do that very well in SWAT, even now, in the current SWAT. What we don't do there is this head cut or the gully erosion on the first order streams. So this is where most of your sediment is getting displaced because the land, the farmers are being smart and they are protecting their land. But once the water leaves the land, it is going to go to a small creek. And that's where most of the erosion is happening is this first order or second order streams. Okay? So that is what we were not simulating until now and that's going to change now with SWAT plus. Okay? And once the river forms for first order, second order, then you have some channel erosion, channel deposition. Sometimes you may have wetlands along the river. So those things can be simulated now more realistically. Okay? And then once you get to the third order, you may start to see some floodplains and so on and so forth. Okay? So what, I'm, what I mean by the area, I'm talking about something like this, less than two square kilometers, 200 hectares. Okay? So we basically have a HRU of somewhere between 200 hectares, then you connect to a first order channel at that point. So your first order headwater will be somewhere between 3 and 10 square kilometer. Your second order channel will be somewhere between 25 and 150 square kilometer. Your third order or main river will become only after about 150. So now we are, instead of simulating just this area here, we are simulating every step of the way here actually until it reaches the main river. So that will be for all, flow, hydrology, sediment, nutrients, everything will be simulated in every respective process. And uh, let me do one more slide on, this, uh, on the sediment. So if you look at this here actually, there in these figures, I uh, think I should have a reference, maybe I forgot the reference here actually. So it's a paper, oh here it is, church. 20, 2002 paper actually. So if you look at the paper, what's happening in the field? What is the transition zone, headwater, tributary, and the main river, for example? So you can see the power of the stream is low as you go down the stream actually. The power of the stream is very high in the headwater. That's where most of the sediment is displaced or most of the sediment is transported in the headwater actually. So that's why you see all this thing very high on the channel versus bed materials, actually. So you can see, if you look at it here again, the zone of erosion is all the headwater here, actually. So once it comes to the floodplain, it slows down because land is flat. The velocity is slow, okay? You are not routing the water that speed, actually, anymore, okay? So the main idea here is to capture this zone, erosion zone here, and whenever there is a flood, it's going to be on your floodplain. It's going to get deposited in your floodplain and then slowly get released over a period of time. Okay. In the US, we have identified through remote sensing technology every farmer's field boundary. So it's about four million farmers boundary actually. Okay. Four to the ten to the power six. So this is what each farm boundary will look like here, actually. So this is what each farm boundary. I'm just zoomed in one of these boundary. So now we can able to simulate every farmer's boundary. You can see there is a creek going right through them, actually. So we will be able to split that farm boundary and be able to simulate 
that stream so that we can identify what is the contribution of each farmer to the nearest river actually. So one of the things that we are talking about in the US is also pollution trading. How do you trade pollution? So if you have a big farmer and small farmer, the big farmers can pay the small farmer not to do something and thereby they can farm more effectively. Or there may be a city that may want to buy your pollution from you, thereby they can pollute more from the city side actually. The city doesn't have much land to distribute the pollution. So they're all concentrated, right? The wastewater, okay, the sanitation, and so on and so forth. Yes. Yes. For the, oh, for the Brazil. There is, okay. So there is, a, uh, pro, there is a company in Europe, I think, is doing that. I don't know whether you have any other source that in Brazil. Well, actually, uh, Embrapa had, uh, has a, a good source for all the farms in Brazil that's called From the Car. Car, which is here, uh, like, uh, rural uh, environment. Rural uh, cadastro. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so everyone knows. <laughs> so they they released uh, um, uh, Imbrapa Territorial, uh, collected all the different uh, rural uh, farms. Um, they have all the shape files and then collected them and integrated so it's all uh, available. So it's a pretty good source too for the entire Brazil. Good. So just to give you a clear picture, if you take a farm or a field like this, actually, they may have a drainage ditch right here, actually, and they may have a stream that's going there, actually. So water could go either here or it can go to the drainage ditch, and the drainage ditch comes and connects back to the river. This is man-made or human-intervened ditches, drainage ditches. So you'll be able to simulate all those more realistically with SWAT+. Plus. I know it's a too busy slide, you don't have to read them, but it's the same management, crop management, landscape management that you can do in SWOT also, actually. Okay? So there's nothing new here. What is new is this new file called communities. Previously, all SWOT simulation is done by monoculture, meaning one crop, one field, that's it. You can't have two crops in the same field. Now no longer you are not limited actually. You can have plant communities, meaning you can have a forest and can grow agri agroforestry, for example. Or because the forest may take about five years to grow, so those five years you could grow something else in between actually. So you can do those type of things. Or you can have what they call cover crops. So in between the plants, you can have a cover crop that covers the land so that you don't have any erosion during the initial stage of the crop. So there are lots of things that you can do with the uh, uh, plant communities that's a new that you can simulate with SWAT plus. The rest are all pretty similar to what you already know in SWAT plus. One of the other thing, again, this is published in a paper, so you may want to read that actually. So here we have introduced decision table. This is a big change from the SWAT to SWAT plus. So what is a decision table? You can have some kind of an Conditions, if that conditions met, you can take action. And within the action, you can have multiple actions or single actions, actually. So in other words, it's like in a coding algorithm, it's if, then, else. Okay? If this is true, do this. If that is not true, do this. That's basically what this is, our decision table is all about. So every decision, every day, it, you can trigger different decisions. So that's what the farmers do, actually. If it's going to rain today, they're not going to apply fertilizer because it's going to run off. It's going to wash out, actually. So they're not going to apply. So that means you can say a rule that's saying that if there is a rain more than half an inch or more than 25 millimeter or more than 15 millimeter, don't irrigate or don't apply fertilizer. Don't apply pesticides. Okay? So the model will automatically do, will not apply and it will wait for a day where it is a clear day or less wind or less of some whatever the condition may be before applying that particular. That's what farmers do. Okay? In the current SWOT, you don't have this feature. You say on May 28th, I applied fertilizer. It's going to apply fertilizer. Whether it's rained or not rained, it's going to apply that fertilizer. By doing everything by addition, not only the uh, crop management, you can do this for reservoir management. Okay? 
You can do that for uh, point source management. Okay? So if there is going to be a major runoff event, actually, you can't treat all those water, right? You're going to let the water go. So that means you can trigger that automatically in the model, thereby your raw sewer may go and collect the river, actually, because there's no amount of treatment facility can hold that much water. So a lot of this realistic uh, phenomena can be implemented in through the decision table, actually. Okay. Here is an example of that. So here is an irrigation example. So here we are saying irrigate only when the water stress becomes 0.8, and when you have rain, at least you apply 25 millimeter of rain. I mean irrigation water. So that's all we are saying, actually. So you can have, here you have one condition, one else condition, and one action you are taking, actually. But you can have as complex as you want. We have certain equations that is very, very, very complex, actually. Okay? So if you, you can have multiple criteria that you want to meet before that could be used. Okay? So the structure of the decision table can be understood easily by the model user. The decision tables more accurately represent the real, real world complex decisions. And the decision tables can easily be maintained and supported. So but you can share your decision table to your next project, actually. And you can recycle them as many as you want. You don't have to recreate them every time, actually. Because decision table is now a data. It is not a one-off input to the model, actually. It's a data that you can recycle them. Yes, yes, you can, no, it's, you can have as many conditions as you want, as many alternatives as you want, actually. Yeah. And I can introduce scenarios of... Yes, exactly, this is what they use for land use change scenario. So you can say, if you, want, if you are in this year, this day, I want to change this HRU 50% to forest, another 30% to something else. Which one? Not yet. We have not gone there yet, actually. But if there are specific things that you have thinking in mind, we can certainly incorporate that, actually, right now. One of the other major uh, thing that we have added is the groundwater mm -hmm. is going to be a lot more realistic in the sense you are going to have, let's say, for example, if you have a um, contribution of groundwater flow or base flow, the upstream is going to contribute first, actually. That means they are going to dry first, the first order streams. Then the second order streams and the third order. Now you can control that through addition table, actually. So in other words, right now in current SWOT, all the streams contribute all the time. Okay? Now you can put a timing saying that upstream is going to con con contribute only a day or two days after rainfall. That's it. Whereas the second order streams may contribute more and third order streams were, so you can be much more realistic in terms of what the contribution by each river segment types actually. And we are also working, it's not complete yet, we are working integrating SWOT plus and mod flow. Okay, so once the mod flow is integrated, you can have both true surface and groundwater model. Okay, so currently with SWOT, we do have this actually. You can use SWOT and mod flow. The SWOT plus and mod flow is still under works and it'll be ready very soon. Okay. We have also added a new module called SWOT DEG. DEG stands for degradation. So previously in SWOT, the channel dimensions are fixed. Whether you run it for 10 years or 100 years, the channel dimensions are fixed. No more actually. You can have dynamic channel properties. Okay. As the year goes by, if the channel is eroding, you are increasing the width or increasing the depth, you can simulate that actually. And that's going to change your channel slope. The long term simulation yep. process. Exactly. You can make this. That's right. That's right. So then you can have the depth, the head cut, and then you can have the adjust your slope, for example. All those things is possible now with SWAT, SWAT Plus.
We are still working on this angle. Yes, go ahead. I have a question. Yeah. And how can you validate this information? How can you get is, this? Is it based on, on observed data or? I mean, it is on the long term, yes. Uh -huh. So what we do is, at least in the US, we have aerial photographs from 1930s uh -huh. to now. So every 10 years, you can go and look at the photograph to see how the channel may have changed. Mm -hmm. Or you can, if you are a geology uh, background, you could go to the stream and be able to walk the stream there. You can get, both based on the year, how the erosion may ha happen, actually. Whether this erosion is happening now or this has happened 20 years ago, for example. Okay. So there is what they call carbon dating. Mm -hmm. okay? So you can be able to look at the carbon. You can look at the CCM. Mm -hmm. So there are specific uh, metals that you can go and uh, take the soil sample mm -hmm. and be able to analyze it. So we know CCM means it's this time of the year. It's happened, actually. So you can look at those things. Oh, let's uh, take an example. The upper Tiete River Basin, so in the upper part yep. where Sao Paulo main city mm -hmm. is. So in the last 100 years, we have several huge changes mm -hmm. in the channel and floodplain. Yep. That means we can, uh, say, reconstruct yep. the, the historical time series in order to catch up on the, the dynamics exactly. we had in the past and also to project the future, yep. Next, the, 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 the channel climate widening, yeah, cl climate death, change, yep. and even the floodplain. Yep. Okay. We are still working on the pesticide, <coughs> pesticides, pathogens, metals, and salts. This is still work in progress, actually. So we'll be finalizing it in the next few months. And the salt, currently, we have two salt component. One is what's happening, what is salts? The TDS, right? Okay, dissolved solids. So that's your sodium chloride, potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, anything that's chloride, that's salt actually. So we are trying to track as many as 10 different chlorides in the river, okay? But in the landscape, we may have only one or two right now, and eventually we may expand that actually. So we are looking at both the salt transport, both the landscape and in the river. Currently, the model has got only the river component actually. Now we are adding the landscape component to that so that you can have, when you do a irrigation, it's going to leach salts to the groundwater and it's going to return that water back to the river. So that whole process can be simulated with this. Previously, when you print SWOT model output, let's say you want monthly output. You have to set monthly and get monthly. If you want daily, you have to go back again and run daily. So you don't have to worry about that anymore, actually. In one sitting, you can ask for daily output. You can ask for monthly output. You can also ask for annual output. So you'll get all the different outputs. You can have average annual output, or you can say, I want only these variables output. So it's highly flexible in what output that you want. So these are all the outputs. So, so now we are divided the output files into where is my, oh, into so many files, actually. Previously, we used to have one file with 70 columns. Okay, now we broke that into smaller files, one for hydrology, one for sediment, one for nutrients, one for pesticide. So the number of files is increased, and you can able to simulate simultaneously or print simultaneously only what you want. So if you want hydrology daily, but sediment monthly, you can ask for that. Okay, so that's the benefit of this new feature of printing. <clears throat> SWOT also has calibration. It's a, it has got a built-in calibration routine. Okay, we are also going to have SWOT plus cup, like SWOT cup, there is a SWOT plus cup. That's, we're still working on that. But the calibration is something that we have started. Uh, what we call uh, soft calibration. So if you know that hydrology or the evapotranspiration should be 60% of your rainfall, you can put that information, then the model will automatically calibrate for that 60%. So you can provide long-term average or expert opinion or real data to say, I want to calibrate for this ranges. So it will calibrate that range for each component, whether it's a HRU component floodplain component, or subbasin component, or river component. 
So there is a paper that got published recently. You may want to take a look at that paper. And uh, that's what this all about here, actually. The paper talks about that, actually. This is my last slide, just to give you again on the SWOT calibration. Here, it gives you the information, like, for example, uh, like Maria was talking about over the years, okay, this is what, what has happened, where the erosion is coming from. Most of the erosion is coming from sheet and drill erosion. Okay, 326. Gully was only 73, tributaries were 42, and so on. So this is what the source is, and this is where the sinks, or where it got deposited, or where it discharged. Okay, this is from 1983 to 1938, actually. Then, let me, I think, it's sitting right here. Just give me one second. So you can see, over the period of 1938 to 1975, they have reduced significant sheet and rill erosion is 114 now. Now it's displacing to more to gullies and more to tributary and so on. Now from 1975 to 1990, the same river was studied by various people actually, both observations and models, aerial photographs. They looked at so many different data to do that. Actually, there is a paper, uh, I think I should have cited somewhere here. Um, so if you look at now, your sheet and rill erosion is much, much less. Overall erosion, the thickness shows you how much erosion was there at that time. Okay? So in these times, this is how much erosion was there. And this, these periods, uh, 80, 38 to 75, this is how, and today how much. This, this is the total erosion here. And here are the contribution from the sources and the sinks. So you will be able to simulate realistically something like this. This is our goal to use SWAT plus to do something like this over a multi-period, actually, or over a long-term period in terms of channel deposition, channel dynamics, and channel uh, degradation, and so on and so forth, actually. Let me stop right here, and maybe I try to answer a few questions you may have, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Three microphones. Huh? Three <laughs> microphones. The other microphone is there. Okay. So uh, uh, thank you very much for your 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 first opening lecture. At this point, we have a clear idea that SWAT Plus had several uh, uh, progress in terms to be more flexible mm -hmm. and friendly. Also, um, some questions, natural questions arise. Yep. I, I tipped one. Some of them. One is related to stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And so um, in one part, in one slide, you mentioned that the stakeholders can uh, make some, uh, say, connections, or, or they, they, they can suggest the way these dynamic tables, yep. Decision could, tables yep. could, could change or yep. shape yep. into the uh, scenarios Yep, decision absolutely. making approach. Mm -hmm. So we have several several scenarios and we need to take some decision making. So for that reason we test the same simulation process during the years yep. with different uh, tasking force. So uh, that is very, for us very clear. Also going to, to the past, mm -hmm. you, you also show some examples. So that means that supplies is bringing uh, a more dynamic view yes to the users. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one question is, it is expected that these new dynamics, they are not bringing, they are sa saving time, yeah. or they need more time to be tested? That's I mean, the, the point. Not, I don't think you need more time in terms of processing your inputs. Everything's going to be automated, actually. But you need to have more time um, conceptualizing. Conceptualizing. Yes. So you need to understand your watershed better. See, previously, it was giving an answer, and you have one point measurement here, right? Mm. So in the stream, that's what you're calibrating. You don't care what happened on the landscape. Now you need to know a little bit more about your process, exactly where that sediment is coming from. Okay? I could adjust either landscape or channel. I can still get the same answer here. But in realistically, in real world, is it happening here? So a field visit or somebody visiting a field or 
having a window, we call window shield survey, you drive around the watershed and see exactly where are the major erosion points and make sure the model is able to simulate those processes more accurately. So just to give you that, that one point, actually, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but just to give you an idea, I prepared this slide. Okay. This is a work. We did not do the work, actually. Our model is not. This is completely a field geomorphology. They went to the field. They used aerial photographs. They went to the infield survey. And they walked every stream in the watershed, actually. When I say geomorphology, these are all students, geology students, actually. So they walked every creek. They need to map everything what they observed here, actually. OK? So over a period of time, they can able to show exactly where the erosions are happening. These are the lakes. OK? These are all the lakes. That's, so you can see this is a lake, and this is a lake. Okay, so they can able to clearly show this is the creek that's producing the most of the erosion to this lake. If you allow the SWOT and you have measurement only at the lake, I could have averaged the whole area, right? I would have got the same answer here. But that's not true. The real picture is the actual erosion is all happening right along this main river here, actually. So in order to represent this, I need to know what's happening in the watershed. Without that knowledge, I would not be able to model. I mean, model may give you relative differences. But if you want to be more accurate, this is three times more than this. I have to have some field knowledge or understanding of what's happening there, actually. So this is completely independent data that we verified by running the model so that we can do. Not only we are able to produce at the outlet of the lake, but also on the landscape, spatial distribution of where the sediment is coming from is able to be captured through the model, actually. So that's what the SWAT plus would allow you to do that, because now we have the first order, second order, third order streams, which is not there before, actually. So that's a different, major difference. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes, of course. And so yeah. that means we need to, to spend more time conceptualizing our uh, system approach that's in terms right. of uh, sources and impacts. That's very clear. So it's very important to. Uh, to hypothesis testing. So we need to spend more time yep. in the creating the, the, right. how our brain is testing the, the hypothesis before that simulating. So yep. Because sometimes we are expecting the simulation process and to, to run up some uh, uh, graphics and to be happy, but we need time to, to continue to spend about the, the, the a priori uh, assumptions. Uh, thank you. Yes. I, I would like to people to, to be introduced by themselves, the name, what is their origin, also the bachelor of what's uh, science, uh, the, or the nationality also. Okay, thank you. This is your time. Why did they ask? <laughs> the camera is over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then it's here. much more worse. <laughs> During this week, all people are coming here to make the questions. Uh, okay. If they know they are not being to be good grading. Yeah. Uh, it's so bad to be cherry picked, actually, you know. <laughs> so I'm Ali. I, uh, I'm Iranian, and I came from USP Pirasikaba. Uh, but I'm studying soil physics, and I also my question was about that. Uh, you, you told the infiltration is modeled by green amped, mm -hmm. but how about the layer be below that? I mean, it, it, does it use Richard's equation or is no, it a tipping no. bucket model? Tipping bucket model, right? Now. And after that, during but we the do have the, the mod flow. Oh, okay. So yeah. if you want to integrate the mod but flow, mod you flow can goes for unsaturated or yes, unsaturated yeah. and also unconfined and uh, confined layers. Okay. And then the next question is, as the, you told, it it also simulates the dynamic change of morphology of river feeds yes. and. So do you think, uh, can it have the ability of modeling of dynamic changes of saturated hydraulic conductivity as the most important factor? If, you have, if you have that knowledge, or how do you parameterize that, actually? Because right now, our soil properties are always not, fixed. Yeah, okay. that's the problem, actually. Yeah. But the carbon changes. When the carbon changes, your water holding capacity changes, actually. And that changes the porosity. 
Yeah, but it doesn't change hydraulic conductivity in the end. I mean, hydraulic conductivity is basically a water holding capacity, right? In a way of uh, looking at it is how much water is going to hold. If that changes, it's also going to change how much water moves through the soil, actually. Mm -hmm. Whatever that's going to be stored, the rest is going to move either yeah. the, to the groundwater or to the lateral flow back to the river, actually. So for root water uptake, it does not consider the feathers model? No, no, we don't. Okay. Because we need more parameters, and yeah, our, yeah. our soil data does not have all the parameters we need, actually. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. It's important to, to say <clears throat> that we now are trying to test medium size to bigger uh, scales. Mm -hmm. So when we are making a pace from microphysics, yep. small scales, to the medium size to or bigger up. scales, we are losing, of course, some of the conceptualization Process. of the microphysics, mm -hmm. but we are gaining other uh, dimensions in terms of other factors like land use, human interactions, or even geomorphology, dynamics, and so on. Mm -hmm. So this is our, I say, uh, paradoxical uh, situation in scaling yep. our process from one scale to other and, and vice versa. Right? Okay. And the one thing that I want to, uh, that's exactly right what Mario is saying. The one thing that we always keep in our back of our mind is whatever we do, we need to make sure it's applicable at the global scale. Meaning anybody from anywhere would be able to use this model. If you ask for any special inputs, that's going to be able to do it only at a micro scale or in a small catchment, then that's never going to scale up. Then a lot of people are not going to use that model actually. So that's one of the major things that we have to keep in mind. How do we use readily available information to answer questions, actually. And also to uh, build up effective parameters. Sometimes that's the, the, the absolute number is not uh, quite easy to understand, but sometimes this is the optimized parameter that your model is be better cal calibrated. Uh, anyway, we have, the we have the possibility to go to the field and to pick information from the field and to, 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 to fit the, yeah. our models, also with the limitations. So when we are writing the proposal or even the paper or uh, attending the reviewers, we need to be very aware about that and to be honest and to, and to have humility of our limitations. Uh, for that way, this is our paradoxical way we are approaching natural and human systems. Uh, Okay, so what question, Brain Sorry. Okay, Bruno, please present yourself, introduce yourself. Where are you from? Ah, que vai Hi, my name is Bruno. I'm a master student here as well, and maybe I'll have to use SWOT Plus in my doctor. I don't know. I don't know yet. So, yeah, mm -hmm. my, my question is, uh, now you said that you have the distribution of information, like for example, if you have erosion in each point, you said mm -hmm. you have that, that stream that have more erosion than the rest of them. But how, uh, I think, sh too much information sometimes, can I scale sure. that down, for example? In my case, I'm going to study small cases, micro drainage cases in a rural mm -hmm. catchment. Mm -hmm. Then I would have uh, smaller spaces, then I would have to study, for example, erosion in that spaces, in that mm -hmm. smaller spaces. Then I was thinking if I could make like a, a, small, a smaller module, then I study that smaller module, how that happened. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, actually. So a lot of the time what we do is we do study at that small scale all our experimental watershed. If you look at all the data that we use to develop all these equations, they all came from a small watershed, OK? They are all first order, second order streams. Okay. Once you go to third, fourth, and fifth order streams, the process is much more simplified because it's a very, very steady state. It is not dynamic, actually. Yes, there may be dynamic on a flood season, but otherwise, 300, 300 days out of 365, it's all steady state model, actually. Okay. So you don't need to worry about it. So most of our model is developed at the small scale, then scale it up to the large scale. But if you have the data at the small scale, it's much more important to be right at that small scale, thereby you can scale it up, actually. If you start only with a very large scale, then you are talking about one point for several thousand square kilometer, 
you can adjust so many different things to get the same answer, right? So if you give the model to you, you may come up with the one answer with a different set of parameters. If I, if I take the model, I may come up with a different, so I mean, same answer, but different parameter sets, actually. So having that small catchment and um, understanding everything on that scale is what's crucial, actually. If you can do that, then the scaling has become very easy at that point. Thank you. Question about empirical models to be converted into traditional ways? Oh yes, it's uh, <laughs> let's continue then. So then, the, I like the idea that you said from the tables that because I'll have uh, information from people. Uh -huh. Yes, I'll have information from uh, like cattle producers, sure. like forest producers, like crop producers. Yep. And how could I put that information in that? Decision that's, table. That's, that's exactly what that decision table is for, actually. You can take every one of those management information. Yes. How do they raise cattle? How, how many days they allow it to grass? Mm -hmm. uh, and how, 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 what is the um, uh, biomass of the grass yes. be, before they remove the cattle use from that, actually? All those information, you can turn that into a decision tables and then use the table. And you can easily modify that table and you say, OK, this field, I can get two tons of biomass, whereas this field I can get only yeah. one ton, so you can fine tune your decision table based on the amount of nice. available biomass, for example, actually. And nice. you can also change it by number of cows. So you may, one, one farmer may have 30 cows, another may have 100 cows, actually, for the same landscape. So you may then, you need to decide how many days it can graze and how many days you have to import feed, all those stuff you can able to decide through tables, decision tables. Okay, very okay. good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, professor, mm -hmm. uh, there is a group from Federal University of Campina Grande, uh -huh. and they are following your presentation. And they oh, will okay. be watching the the the, the course okay. during this week. And they said that they are enjoying this presentation. Excellent. And they have around three students that they will work with SWAT, mm -hmm. SWAT or SWAT Plus. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm in touch with Professor Carlos Galvão from that university. Okay. And they said that, uh, this is their words, we are very interested in using time series of evapotranspiration, land use, and seasonal characteristics of deciduous vegetation, such as Caatinga, where leaves fall during the dry season, changes in LAI from month to month. Yes. And they also said that they appreciate the participation of Danny and they really like you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. The leaf area index, certainly you can change through the addition table or in the plant table itself you can change actually. Previously, all our um, crop growth model is based on temperature based actually, meaning if it is warm enough, it can grow. But now we are changing that both temperature or precipitation. So if you are in the equator, like plus or minus 25 degrees from equator, they are mostly tropical vegetation. So they grow based on, because the temperature is throughout the year, they have temperature. So they are not limited by temperature, they are limited by precipitation. So their growth cycle follows the precipitation cycle, not the temperature cycle. So in the new uh, crop growth model, we have both temperature cycle and the precipitation cycle. So you can easily turn the knob saying that I want to, for this watershed, I want to use my precipitation cycle, then it will follow, thereby you can able to reduce, I mean, when the uh, water stress hits, your leaf will start to fall down actually automatically, okay? So right now it's waiting for the temperature stress to do that. So we don't take water stress into the account actually. Now you can incorporate water stress. So as far as the ET, I would recommend two ways to do that, actually. One, either you can bring in the ET directly as an input so that the model will not simulate any ET, it will use your ET, or you use the ET to calibrate, okay? If it is a spatially distributed ET, it is much better because that's what we just now finished writing a paper in Ethiopia where we got remotely sensed ET model Okay, we are daily evapotranspiration from the satellite image, and we are using that to calibrate SWOT spatially, and then using the stream flow to compute temporally, actually. Okay, so that we are using stream flow's validation, and 
ET as calibration. Okay? Because it's spatially distributed, actually. So that you want to make sure your hydrology is right in the spatial scale, because your stream flow is just one point in the river. Okay? So you may have only about 10 points in the river, actually, to manage. Whereas in the spatial scale, you have lots and lots of data, there actually. So yes, you can use both ways. Both SWOT and SWOT plus can accommodate the ET component of that, actually. Yes. Other questions? Other questions? Yes. No, no, that's okay. I can understand Portuguese. I have, <laughs> I have right there. <laughs> Ai, que bom. <laughs> é, oh, boa tarde. Eu sou a Denise, eu sou geógrafa e faço doutorado na saúde pública. E eu estou estudando escoamento de agrotóxicos em pontos de captação de água para abastecimento público. E eu tenho a informação é, da, dos produtores, dos agricultores, e de pontos de irrigação. Mas eu não sei se eu vou conseguir monitorar agrotóxicos na estação de tratamento de água. Eu consigo estimar a partir do que eu sei que eles estão aplicando na propriedade, eu consigo estimar no canal principal é, o quanto está chegando de agrotóxico na, naquele ponto e se eu posso usar é, só o dado de vazão para calibrar o, a modelagem? I was thinking Mario was going to translate, so I was like, oh, okay, she can say everything. I was <laughs> But, okay, so she, Denise, right? Denise, she's actually a geographer, and she's uh, doing her PhD in health, uh, public health. Oh. So she's working, interested on pesticide application in agriculture, especially, but um, uh, in terms of water supply. Okay. So how that can affect in water supply and in the water treatment plants. But she has information for the from the field and for from the farmers. Um, on how much they input, Apply. yeah, pesticide. But the, she wants to know. Yeah. So she wants to know how much pesticide uh, would have in the treatment plant. Sure. But she has no data in the treatment plant. Okay. I asked Danny not for to translate, but to, to take the answer. That is uh. <laughs> okay. But thank you very much for. I, I thought it was easier <laughs> to translate now. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we have, I mean, pesticide is one of the way underutilized module within SWAT because SWAT pesticide is very, very good in the sense um, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, uses the SWAT model for pesticide registration. So what I mean by registration, so the pesticide company have to run models like SWAT to estimate how much when the farmer apply, how much of that pesticide goes to air, how much goes to the water, how much goes into the soil and to the groundwater. So they have to estimate this and then only EPA will give them approval to apply. So if they say you can apply two kilograms per hectare and that's going to produce more pesticide in the river, thereby your uh, fish is going to get killed or your drinking water supply is going to get contaminated, they will not permit that actually. So they will say you have to reduce to 1.5 or 1 is the maximum permit because whatever permitted, farmers can apply only up to the permit level. They cannot apply more than that. So if you know actually what the farmers are applying, you can use that in the model and run through that and then estimate both what's left in the soil, what's in the groundwater, and what's in the river and we have done that study for atrazine. There is a specific atrazine. So we did this for 200 drinking water supply lakes in the US actually. And based on that, EPA has changed the law recently to reduce the atrazine loading. Otherwise, it's too much right now, okay? Because as the science developed, as we get more and more data, we are able to change that through extension of models. Models is one answer, not the model is not the full answer, but model is able to inform what is the effectiveness in terms of soil, groundwater, and in the lakes and rivers. Yeah. And we're also doing the same thing for bacteria. 
chlor uh, chloroform bacteria, E. coli, um, cryptosporidium. So we are, we are doing the same thing for bacteria also, actually. So there is a lot of water. Drinking water supply has got problem with it, bacterial contamination, especially from animal manure. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for your yes. presentation. My name is Denise Tafarello. I'm taking my postdoctoral research here. And I have a question. Yes. Please, Professor Srini, uh, what are the advantages of the use of SWAT Plus compared to SWAT, of course, in the ecosystem services studies? And if you are possible, give us some examples, please. Okay. Uh, the major benefit of SWAT Plus is the realistic, how realistically you can simulate, actually. Okay. One other thing I talked about, pollution trading. So the pollution trading is an ecosystem services, actually. So whoever pollutes space, so that means you need to have an accurate accountability of where the pollution is coming from. So that's where the SWAT Plus, because right now I can tell you only at the HRU or at the sub-basin level in the current SWAT. I don't know what's happening between the HRU to the watershed outlet because we just lumped them all together actually as one number. With SWAT Plus, you'll be able to see all along the river what's happening. So if you want, to, let's say if you're a government agency and you have million dollars to invest to reduce pollution, you need to know where it is coming from, right? That's the ecosystem services. So that's where the SWAT Plus would be more useful or more beneficial is to depict the realistic scenario, the realistic um, representation of your watershed through the modeling system. That's what we are trying, hoping. Yes, but in this, in this, in this case, for, for majors, mm -hmm. city majors, mm -hmm. you know, in the United States, in North America, in Europe, sure. even in Japan, China today, this is uh, uh, raising the culture of every year report of mm -hmm. every city, they put how they are getting the greening, what, the yes. low yes. carbon economy. Yep. So how they are depleting the carbon dioxide emissions yep. and so on. So my question is, uh, is SWAT Plus a kind of friendly or more friendly tool to uh, say for measures, uh, say uh, uh, to be closer to the consumers or stakeholders or, or clients or citizens to say, okay, guys, in this urban catchment, we are mitigating the, this, this carbon dioxide in these rates and yep. so on. So you mean this is, is easier th through SWOT Plus or is this a, because I, I, I get in the SWOT Plus more as a friendly customer yes. uh, based approach. You are, you are exactly uh, but it's still right. maintaining the traditional Tradition. hydrological yep. uh, 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 validity. No, no, it? you are exactly right, actually. That exactly, by representing the realism, we are able to capture that both spatially and temporally. But there is also one other point, actually. Right now, at least the cities are looking at how do they get green energy, yes. for example, or green, clean water, okay? What they are not accounting is what's leaving the city, of course. okay? So that's where SWAT can provide the knowledge, like, OK, of this, this area is consuming more water. Yeah. OK? If this area is having more pollution is coming from this area, this creek, or this uh, subdivision, or this region of the city. So that means wherever they want to invest on more in future dollars to the protect or to reduce the erosion, they need to know where to invest there, actually. So that's where SWAT can help in that regard, actually. Important point. Uh, an example that you mentioned, uh, uh, Bruno, you have a small scale BMPs, mm -hmm. best management, pra management practice at the local farming scale. So when they are producing erosion, the, some pollutants coming with the erosion is carbon yeah. also. And through some experiment, we have, and you, you know that, some experimental catching these pollutants and, and measuring. measuring the input and output, some of them, or mostly of them, they are trapping pollutants and also carbon. So that they are, uh, say, acting as carbon trapping uh, uh, tools. And sure. SWAT Plus yep. has this, this condition, so yes. uh, all this balance. So this is 
uh, at to now, you know, it's major trying to be greener and so on. So yeah. SWOT Plus has a very good, uh, uh, I say, tool, you know. Yes, uh, I was going to ask uh, like something similar to what Mario is, is asking. Uh, you said we can like put every small lake, even if it's not connected now. Mm -hmm. How much can I modify that lake, for example, to say that capture of nutrient or to say infiltration? How much can I modify that, that I lake, mean, It for depends example? on well, if that is going to be a BMP. Let's say if there yes. is a BMP that can capture that, yes. then you can simulate as a broad scale or local scale, meaning, OK, I can target the top 20 pollution cities or 20 pollution field. If you have top 20, only apply to those areas, for example. Don't apply to everywhere, actually. Or you can apply to everywhere, and you say, OK, what happens if the farmers adapt this new technology that's going to reduce their pollution 20%, 30% of the farmers, actually? So how that's going to change? So either you can do randomly apply that to 30%, or you can say, here are the top polluters. I want to apply these changes only to them, for example. So for example, I can put for the whole area is this one characteristic yep. and a little bit of the area exactly. I can change. Yes. OK. Yes. You okay. can target you. where you want to change only the area that you want to change. So you, yes. you first run the baseline run and say, OK, well, what is the contribution from everywhere? Then you can target, OK, here are the hot spots. So I want to change only in these places those characteristics to see whether I can make an improvement in the overall water quality. Thank you. Yep. I have received a, a question from the student, student is not following us, but he's uh, making close to 500 simulations okay. with a bioretention uh, tool, as I mentioned before, and also changing the, the return period of the, the, of the precipitation. Uh -huh. And also the timing of the precipitation mm -hmm. is this, uh, the, 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 the biggest intensity at, sure. the, at, uh, at, at, at the beginning or at, yep. at, at the end or in the middle. And also different condition of the soil oh, and the okay. land use and land cover change. Mm -hmm. And also with uh, the uncertainty. This is Marcus. Eh? Marcus, thank you very much. You are in the internet eh? mm -hmm. just now. Uh, and also in, in quantitative manner. Okay. So they have, he has the... Uh, quantitative water balance, and you can plug in this with pollution, yep, yep. Uh, the, the, the pollutograph mm -hmm. uh, uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question again is that we need perhaps to, to make some uh, demonstrative pilot projects in Brazil with this uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative, uh, because we have several examples. Here you have several, um, and perhaps uh, uh, taking a look with what we are doing, our colleagues in Africa and Asia sure. and North America and, and sure. Europe. Sure. So I think in this, during these uh, four, five days, we have the conditions not only to express our questions uh, or even our main uh, interrogation about that, but it's also to, to gain space in order to be or to discuss more our findings with others. It's sometimes we need to finish up our paper and we have a discussion uh, section and we need to know more about the others. Sure. So I, I think that there are plenty of people working with the SWOT and even with other models, plugging swing model with the SWOT, as you mentioned, while those E or, or even mod flow and so on. So I, I, I expect that this five years, five days, sorry, cars has the chance that we discuss more about how our community is working and exchange more about the reference, the literacy, the literature we have in terms of uh, hydrological modeling, quantitative and qualitative, more scenarios approach, more user friendly, customer, stakeholders, uh, decision making, and so on. So I think more diverse, the more diverse the course uh, ha uh, ha is. Uh, the most, uh, I say, fruitful we are going to, to be at the end of this course. So please uh, share your findings, your thoughts about uh, whichever question you have about that. Thank you, Marcus, again. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, more questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, because uh, uh, Srini has just arrived today <laughs> after more than 10 hours, uh, flying, uh, 
has not stopped in, in, in the hotel. I would like to thank Trini and Daniele, our professors this week. And I would like to invite you all together to, to capture the moment through a picture here in the front and to maintain these records for from the school. So thank you, uh, thank Srini, you. for you. coming. I think you may, do you want to mention them? Uh, since I didn't realize a lot of people are going to watch from the internet about the installation of the software and everything. Actually, do you oh, want to? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, tomorrow and the day after, we are going to do a tutorial and step-by-step -step, uh, going through the SWAT Plus. Um, and we wanted to make sure that everyone installed uh, the key GIS correctly and the SWAT Plus plugin there, and it's working. Everyone tested it? Todo mundo testó? No. <laughs> uh, uh, so if you can maybe test it, or uh, testar um, para. So we can start tomorrow morning maybe uh, with all of it uh, working well. So we can, uh, yeah, so have a productive. those who are productive. On online, they also Yeah, the for everyone thing. that is online too. So make sure you install the KeyGIS 3.4 and then the SWAT Plus plugin. And it has instructions on the SWAT website. Um, also, so the, the goal is for the next two days to do this step-by-step uh, -step approach. And we want to hear from you as well as Mario said that it will be as more fruitful as we hear more from you and we can adjust whatever we are going um, so it can be better uh, for you and for all the ones that are online as well. So please let us know uh, prior to it, okay? Yep. Yes, we are just formatting a new project through around SWAT Plus. Eh? So during this week, also we have not time to discuss about that and to refine and submit yep. the proposal. So some of you are, will, will be invited to to, to, to to fit some inputs. But anyway, you, you, uh, whichever uh, uh, the, the question you have, please, uh, in Portuguese or in English, uh, you, you, you can find out us. Uh, Daniela. Well, I, I, I need to say sorry because I cannot follow all the classes because I, I need to, to teach. So I have my own lectures outside of this classroom. What's a pity. But anyway, I need to be paid. And my salary was paid by I'm teaching there. Huh? So anyway, please enjoy the, 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 the course. We have some coffee breaks in the morning and also in the afternoon. And if you uh, find some colleague that's lost the, the first day today, please, we have still places to, to join us. So send to them emails to follow us in presence or even virtually by the internet. So now we have seven or eight people following us on the internet, okay? So again, please uh, join us during this uh, uh, golden week, okay? So thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.